You're listening to the Inspired Legacy Podcast on the Edify Podcast Network. This is episode 68. Put God first. Hey guys, it's Mark, your host and founder of the Inspired Legacy. As always, this is the show that seeks to equip and inspire you to leave a godly legacy. On today's show, I welcome back my friend, Chris Hood. Chris is an entrepreneur, business coach, and mentor to business owners looking to implement principles of biblical entrepreneurship into their business. And like I just mentioned, Chris is a return guest, but if his name doesn't ring a bell, it's because you've got to go all the way back to episode two to meet Chris. And when I knew Chris would be coming back, I wanted to try something a little different. So rather than recording our interview remotely, which is how I typically do all of my interviews, I decided to have Chris join me in person. So if today's show sounds uh, a little different or has a little bit of a different vibe to it, just the fact that he's sitting across from me probably has a lot to do with that. But today, Chris and I, we partially revisit his testimony that he really unpacks in episode two. But today, we really spent most of our time talking about intentional time with the Lord, being obedient to his spirit, and how doing so can have a profound impact on the trajectory of our lives. Chris, welcome to the show. Thanks, Mark. This is an honor. This is fun for me because, like I just mentioned, you were my first guest in studio Wow. And when I say studio, I mean multi-million dollar recording facility. Yeah, this is this is sweet. That is not true. This is my spare bedroom turned into an office. Uh, but yeah, man, this is fun. And um, you people who have listened to the show a while might remember your voice, might remember your name. You were my second guest on episode two. Okay. So that's been a while ago. And so guys listening... Um, I would encourage you, if you have not listened to episode two, hit the pause button right now. Go back and listen to Chris's testimony. Uh, it is, it's a powerful story, and it really sets the stage to the conversation we're going to be having today. And so let me just open up the hood into my life a little bit. Um, the reason that we are sitting here today, the reason that Chris is back on the show, uh, you and I had lunch what, a couple weeks ago. We did and just kind of shooting the breeze you know you're asking me how things are going and somewhere in the course of our conversation i mentioned the fact that i had been toying with the idea and i have not mentioned this um on the show before but i've been toying with the idea of either scaling back the show or shutting it down altogether and i know that might come as a shock to some people considering the fact that i came out of the gate in january of 2021 with season three it's like guns ablaze and I had some of the best or I should say most prominent guests that I've ever had on um, numbers have spiked and kind of gone through the roof compared to where they were and so the idea of bringing this to a close really caught me off guard because it was uh, it, it was some it was one of those things where I just kind of felt I cannot explain it man and I couldn't explain it to you when we we're having lunch I just had this feeling like God was trying to tell me this thing is coming to an end. Mm. And I think I had somewhat of a sense of peace when I felt that. I mean, I was surprised, uh, but at the same time, I almost had a sense of peace. And then, of course, I was looking for other verifiers um, from people that I talked to, you know, messages that I heard in church, things that I was reading, what I was reading in the Word. Um again, for verification, but oddly enough, uh, I heard a, a, a message in our church that directly contradicted what I thought I was hearing from God and other little, like probably not coincidentally, but you know, I'll use that word to kind of set the stage. Two or three people reached out to me randomly and just kind of expressed how much the show meant to them, the value that they got from the show. And so there I was sitting, okay, here I, I thought I had this kind of prophetic message from God that the show was coming to an end, yet I'm hearing something that totally contradicts that uh, from my pastor, and he didn't know what was going on, but it's just one of those messages that kind of like spoke to me. Mm-hmm. And I'm hearing all this positive feedback from other people, so I'm like, okay, what, what's going on here? 
And I, I sort of expressed this to you at lunch. And the first question out of your mouth was, well, have you done your two chairs? <laughs> I probably got a sheepish uh, grin on my face and I had to, I had to say, no, not really. <laughs> We're going to circle back to that concept of two chairs, but I, I have, um, I've done it to a degree, but not as intentionally as what we're going to unpack today. So for those listening, again, if you haven't heard episode two, go back and listen to it. Chris brings up this concept of uh, two chairs, but what it is is basically you, you set out two chairs, one for you and one for God and one chair, you set a Bible. And so it might seem kind of cheesy on the surface, but I think it's, it's a very intentional action that we can take to really invite the spirit into the room and invite God in, into a dialogue and a conversation. But I had not gone that far to literally set a Bible in the chair. I mean, I I'd read the word and prayed and attempted to kind of hear what he said, but not, not as intentionally as what I just described. So Chris, welcome to the show. I'm excited to kind of unpack this. Um, hearing that, you, you probably haven't thought about that since we had lunch uh, the other day, but any other thoughts as to uh, where I go from here? You know, the I think uh, touching on two chairs is is significant right now, and that it's not my concept. It's uh, it's something that I learned when I was when I was really confused in life and searching heavily. Um, I had an invitation to go down and and I referenced this before, but I had an invitation to, to go down and meet the Ziegler team and potentially join their team to represent the landscaping industry. And I think this was in 2015 and I went down there, uh, went down to Texas, North, the North part of Dallas. And I was sitting in this conference at this table with, the, the people at the table were extraordinary. I'm not going to get all weedy on that, but we're still very close friends now. And we were sitting there, and this gentleman came out. He was uh, kind of like a keynote. Everybody there was kind of, you know, the speakers were all significant, so I don't mean to minimize anybody that was there. But there's a gentleman that came out to speak, and his name is Bob Bodine. And he asked us some questions. He said, what do you do when life gets challenging? You know, where do you go when you're looking for questions? Where do you go when you seek? How do you start your day, basically? You know, I I, I don't mean that as a question of, well, you go to bed early. That's how you start your day, but the best way to start. But he was talking about what is a tool, a tangible tool that you can use daily ideally to start your day and so he he took us through some scenarios and he said let's say your wife is laying in bed and I'm just kind of making up scenarios because I can't remember and it doesn't really matter but it's the point that let's say your wife is laying in a hospital room somewhere and she has cancer stage four cancer stage four cancer and you don't really know where to turn you know that's that would be oh so hard and mm-hmm. he goes why don't you start with two chairs take it to two chairs and he put up his fingers like this the two fingers and he kept saying what if your kid gets in an accident two chairs and he kept doing this and he got that room so electrified and hopping because we all were looking at each other and going, wait a minute, this is what, this is what Christ did. And he, and Bob was talking about this, this concept and, and that's how it started for me with the two chairs and, uh, oh my gosh, I can't, I, I, I can't express enough. I can't put into words what that concept has done for my life. Just spending time intentionally with God with, and, and Mark referenced, uh, you set up two chairs and you place a Bible on one of the chairs, right? Mm-hmm. Well, open the Bible because mm-hmm. it's his open breathing, living word. So I started implementing that process and I, I did it a lot. 
initially. And then I, I kind of, I was like, okay, wow, this is really great. And then, you, you know, something's working great. So what do you do a lot of times? Well, you kind of sometimes quit doing it. Right. Right. <laughs> I don't know, but I did. And, and, you know, fast forward, um, a short period of time. Uh, I think it was, I think it was 20, 2016. Yeah. Late 2016. I can tell you guys this, and I don't remember if I referenced this in my initial podcast, but I was in Florida and not because of the two chairs process specifically, but because of the Holy Spirit's response or God's response to that obedience, being obedient with spending time, intentional time with him and just listening for God's voice. And if he would give me anything, I would do it. I would call the person. I would do the thing, whatever it was. And that's what it is. It's not, it's not that two chairs becomes an idol or that concepts become, become some level of idolatry, but it's the fact that it facilitates just a great conversation with the Holy spirit, with God himself saying, Mark, do this thing, Mm -hmm. Chris, do this thing. So go back down to Florida and I'm sitting, that's not right. I'm, I'm laying in a, in a bed in a hotel room. And at, at this point of our lives, I had surrendered everything that I was and had pretty much. I was like, I I don't, I don't really know where you're taking me, God, but I, but I, I'm trusting you and I'm following you. And this is where it gets kind of, it's hard for me to get through this, but I'm going to do my best here. But so I was laying in a, in a hotel bed and it was a really nice hotel. And I can tell you it got hard for us because I, I, again, going back to my old podcast or doesn't matter. It's the, the original story. I felt like God had asked me in 2008 to surrender or sell everything. And I Mm -hmm. didn't do that. And then at this point down in Florida, after I had surrendered my business, which kind of like my talent kind of like to me became like an idol to me and Mm -hmm. all of our stuff and, you know, so on and so forth. And the attention that we got from, from our talent or whatever, um, became kind of like an idol, but I was laying there in the bed and I was like, my son, my, my son got denied lunch on his birthday and they put a stamp on his hand. Mm. That's hard. That's humbling. And I was laying there and because there was no money in the account, no money at, at we were too far yeah. negative with the, the lunch and this is where that might not be exactly right, but that's the way I remember it. And it's whatever it was convicting. And I was laying there thinking I'm done. I don't want, I'm done with all of this. I'm done with you, God. I'm done with all of this. This is stupid. This is a waste of time. I'm just throwing away time. And I felt like God said, you get up right now and go over and sit in your chair, do the two chairs. And I was like, forget it. I'm done. I don't even want to live anymore, literally. And I felt like he said, get over there, go to that chair and open your Bible to John 132 specific. Mm. Like what the heck? Well, (laughs) I'm, I like, adventure so I, the curiosity <laughs> got me i'm like john 132 what's that what's that say so i went to john 132 set up set up my two chairs and open my bible and and read john 132 and what that what that is is the dove coming down on christ wow when Noah sent the dove out, it left the ark. Yep. And it didn't come back until John one thirty two. So there was a lot of separation from God, a lot of, for me, a lot of separation from peace and so on and so forth. Well, 
when I read that, it gave me so much hope. But what I haven't told you was that day I completed a certification process to become a an instructor of a curriculum called Biblical Entrepreneurship, which helps people multiply their talent sustainably, that what they were set apart to do in this world sustainably, like Christ, he mm-hmm. gave, shared his spirit. So that's what the, the curriculum. I became certified as an instructor. I pitched the vision of 828, which is just so much bigger than me. I became certified as an instructor with people from all over the world. And I was sitting there looking around, pitching the vision, and it was a mess because I was so upset. I was like, I was like, God, I don't, I don't even want to do this. I just want to do something simple and so on and so forth. But I knew it wasn't pitching the vision of 828 that was significant. It was the the obedience of finishing the program and pitching the vision that just the obedience. And I knew that. And my messaging was when I pitched it, it was really messy and just incomplete. And I'm like, I don't even know what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. And as a, as a man who comes from an industry where you have to have stuff kind of buttoned and crossed, otherwise you're not going to move people to action, especially when you're doing large construction related projects, you got to kind of know what you're doing. And that act, the activation of that, oh, my gosh, oh, oh, my gosh. It, it was it was so life-changing to reflect back on that John 132 and think about that and think about the fact that I did get up and do those two chairs, <laughs> especially, especially when I didn't want to. Yeah. Mark, you're doing this podcast, especially, I don't, I don't know, I know your heart, and you have a huge heart, and being separated from something like, you know, you're spiritual accountability team will come around you and complete you like you're a seed that is rooting in the soil. And I believe your, your accountability team, those that want everything for you and nothing from you Mm. come around you and complete you so that you as a seed can root into the soil that they are and know that you're not going to be uprooted. That's the, that's the kingdom. I believe that's your brotherhood. That's your iron sharpening iron. And knowing your heart and knowing what you have to share with this platform that you call your inspired legacy podcast and the fact that, 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 that that's your legacy, but knowing that, that you were getting maybe attacked a little bit by that and your accountability team was saying, even maybe supernaturally through sermons or whatever, or people messaging you randomly or what I felt led to, to share. I don't know. Um, but that to me says, do it, do it, you know, pray, pray into it, pray into it. And then ask your accountability team specifically, okay, should I do this or should I not do this? And again, that's, that's like maybe one hundredth of 1% of what two chairs is Mm -hmm. for me. And I guess uh, we should clarify that, you know, you mentioned um, Bob Odin. He actually wrote a book called Two Chairs. And so when we reference this concept, it's from that book. Um, yeah, you're right. I know that thought had crossed my mind at the time. Is this Satan? Is this podcast benefiting the kingdom to a degree that Satan is trying to shut it down? Yeah. I know we're called to live a life of service and, I get personal enjoyment from doing this podcast, even though it is a lot of work because I do everything, but I do look at it as an act of service to a certain degree because I'm not getting paid anything. Uh, it is benefiting other people. So I don't know. I'm not trying to pat myself on the back, but I mean, that's really why I do it is for myself, but also because I know it's helping other guys out there. Uh, in fact, I just was texting with a guy, uh, last night he was going through some stuff and I didn't really have a great answer for him. And it was late at night. So 
I don't think either one of us were looking to get on the phone and into a conversation, but I, as I was preparing for this interview, I was kind of going back through a lot of my old episodes and I ran across two that specifically spoke to what he was going through. So I referenced those and pointed him in that direction. And, and I don't know if it helped or not, but one small example of how this platform might be helping but your story of obedience is, it always blows my mind because as the idea of me shutting this thing down as hard as I've worked on it, let me, let me back up. I have worked hard to get it to where it is today, but it is not earning me any money. So I, if I did shut it down, I wouldn't feel it necessarily in my pocketbook, but here you are. And I don't want to overlap too much with episode two, but you talk about this, you know, you, God's telling you to walk away from your entire livelihood, this thriving, successful business that you built. You didn't do it right away, but ultimately you did. And I'm just like, man, talk about obedience. It blows me away. Because we hear stories about that in the Bible, right? But there's, they happen so far, so long ago. We feel so far removed. They almost don't feel real sometimes. Yeah. But here, you're a real life living example of somebody who gave up a lot. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but I, okay, so you, you referenced something. I want to touch on this because this is a biblical principle. You said you don't get paid for doing what you're doing. When, when I experienced um, payment in terms of a certificate, of appreciation we call that money certificate of, of appreciation there was never enough for me when i was in business you know it was just let's let's make more let's scale more we were doing bigger projects and it, i wasn't only driven by money but that was a big thing but what i've learned now and i'm going to touch on what you said you don't get paid money is good and and um, it's very important, you know, like, like Zig Ziglar said, it's kind of like oxygen. We mm-hmm. need it, but it's not the root of all evil. No, it's not. That's, it's the love of money as a root of all evil, right? you know? And if it's a blessing from the Lord, there's never sorrow tied to it either, right. which is interesting. That's a proverb, but, but going back to that principle payment to me, being disobedient with I, what I believe God was prompting me to do is you can't well the most significant voice in our lives is our own the most significant voice the most influential voice in mark henderson's life is mark henderson's voice and you can go back to scripture and talk about you know the the spirit inside you and things but but the level of respect that we feel, the respect that we feel from being obedient to God, the payment in a form of payment that you can't take any amount of money and buy that respect. Mm. You can't. So, so the things that you get from serving other people, like what you're doing right here, the feelings that you get, the level of self-respect of being obedient, that level of respect is comes at an extraordinary cost. It's it's about being selfish, selfish, selfless. Yeah, and uh, I believe that's a, a, again that's like a confirmation of God saying, "Mark, you I'm." putting this right in front of you. Ask me what's next. Ask me. I'm going to send people. Mm-hmm. I'm going to send people to you and and c- confirm that I want to bless you with this and the feelings that you get like that guy that you were able to reference those two podcasts to that yeah. were significant to his story. Those to me are confirmations. Mm. You know, because I think it's is it revelation 3 something 3 maybe I don't remember 323 or something that they will be um, they will be, it's something about the, the words of their testimony will set people free. Mm. The bl- blood of the lamb and the, it's the blood of the, of the lamb and the words of your testimony are the, the most significant things. And I can't remember how, what, what the, how to, 
I can't quote that right now, but, but for me, um, surrendering everything was almost like buying back my life from a respect level. And I was able to experience depths of relationship that I never had before when I was seeking money. And I saw people seeking things. I saw them going after more and more and more stuff. And a lot of times they were just really lost. And I, again, I, I don't want to repeat everything from the second podcast, but I kept seeing this. There's so much angst, searching so hard, working so hard, driving people so hard. And largely that was my story you know, driving so hard, doing mm-hmm. anything I could to feel something. Yeah. Well, now I have an, I believe that I have a fundamental understanding of, I was looking for respect and especially self-respect mm. and I could not buy that. Is your identity tied into what you did? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That's, I've experienced that in my own life. I think it's so common, especially for men. Yeah. Um, you know, we were, we were put on this earth to work. And I think that we are all spiritually gifted to do unique types of work, but I don't think that specific jobs we have in life define us. No. Um, yeah. My intent is to not make this show about me and this and what I'm going to do with this podcast, but I really wanted to tie it back to again, what I think a lot of guys go through and that is, obedience to the Lord. And you raised an interesting point there that you were buying back a a sense of respect, self-respect, right? Mm -hmm. You can tie it back into just self-discipline in general, right? When I know that, you know, I'm, I have not been good about going to the gym basically all of 2020 until now. Um, but there was a, a good long season prior to uh, the pandemic where I was going to the gym regularly and I felt better about myself. Yeah. I looked better. I felt better and I had more confidence and I know that, you know, God wants us to take care of our bodies cause it's the temple, right? Where he resides and yeah. um, he, he wants us to take care of our bodies. And so I'm sure that that was a, it's a, anytime we are sitting on the couch thinking I probably should go to the gym or work out or do a sit up or whatever, it's probably the spirit talking to you, telling you to get up off your butt and take care of your body. So I don't know. I just, when you mentioned that, it made me think of self-discipline and, yeah, and that can take on other forms besides physical fitness, but yeah. Well, when we surrender to our internal government, which is the spirit, you know, I believe good things happen. This podcast is part of the Edify Podcast Network. Edify is a faith-inspiring app that brings together thousands of the best Christian podcasts in one place for your listening enjoyment. Cut through the noise and grow your faith by diving into the world's top Christian podcasts today. Download the Edify app for free from the App Store or Google Play or by going to edify.app. That's E-D-I-F-I dot app. So I want to circle back to that moment in time when you were in Florida, you said you had just become certified in BE. Yeah. Biblical entrepreneurship. Yeah. Where's that taking you? Well, okay. So again, it's, it's about obedience, right? So I, I, I finished, I finished that process and, uh, um, yeah, it, it, it's, it's, it, it's, profound who I was working with there. That's where I, that's where I started. You know, I continued my relationship with Glenn, as you know, Glenn Reppel, he's a one, one of my, I look up to him so much spiritually, but, um, people from all over the world, like I mentioned before, and we've just largely become just tighter than tree bark. It's just amazing that network and, so let me share this. So that was, that was, I think on a Friday or Saturday. And again, we were down in, down in Florida and the week after this certification, they had this program called, uh, Nehemiah week. It was a week long kind of celebration with people from all over the world. And, uh, 
they had what they called the kingdom business tour. And I was going to skip it because I was like, man, I, I already have all this experience with business and I kind of get the whole biblical entrepreneurship perspective, you know, biblical entrepreneurship is kind of like taking a business mastery degree and overlaying Bible verse citation over the top of the business mastery or the business principles and practices. So you can undergird your business, the principles and practices with Bible verse citation. So you can just say, okay, God, you tell us such and such. Now let's just do this. This is your business, not mine. And it's, Mm -hmm. oh man, wow. So Monday morning comes up, right? And, and I go to this sort of a, no, I go to this, uh, uh, Nehemiah week and I get on this bus, Mark, and we go and tour the first business. And I'm like, okay, this is great. You know, meeting all these people. I'm with all my friends that I got certified with and stuff. And there's this gentleman, well, the, the founder of our, uh, of this ministry, he's a prince from Cameroon, Africa. Patrice Sage is his name. Amazing guy. But anyway, he says, Hey, uh, there's somebody that somebody that I just met in Malaysia that I just ran into him, uh, a month or two ago, or actually, I think it was a week or two ago. He said at this point and at this time, and he said, he, his message is so profound. I invited him to come over to the United States. So he's here and he wants to share a message and we didn't have anywhere in our programming to plug him in. So he's just going to share with you guys while you're riding to the next kingdom business tour, the business. So he climbs on this bus before we take off and he looks at me and his jaw drops and he says, God told me you would connect me in the United States. He knew me. He saw my face. God showed him my face. And I turned around and I turned back around. And he said, pointed at me and he looked me right in the pupil. So I knew he was talking to me. He was right in front of me. He said, God told me you would connect me. I'm like, wow, if that's the case, you're probably going to have to come to South Dakota. <laughs> what the <laughs> heck? Well, I knew that God used anti-sex trafficking and just various things that I had gone through to connect me in the faith world and especially Nehemiah, you know, but it doesn't matter, whatever, whatever I, he's just blessed me with, again, he's shown me a lot of favor and blessed me with not only in the United States, but with the international faith leadership community, which is profound to me. What the heck? It's amazing to me. And so this all happened and we spent a bunch of time together that week. And one thing after another happened, I called my wife and I said, honey, something just happened. I believe this was Monday afternoon. I said, honey, this isn't going to make sense. We have no money. But I, I said, I feel like you're supposed to come down to Florida and meet some of these people. I don't, honey, I, I can't explain what's happening down here. And she goes, well, you know that I drive kids and I can't just get somebody to drive my route for me. And she drives bus for Brandon transportation. And I said, well, I just, if there's any way, you know, just see if you can. She went to her manager and the manager said, absolutely. You need to go down there. Financially, it worked out. She was able to fly down the next day. Wow. So she gets to Florida. I go pick her up at the airport on Tuesday. Check this out. We go back to the hotel, this huge hotel, and there's restaurants everywhere. And there's, you know, there's, uh, yeah, just huge. And uh, I'm like, okay, I don't even know where to start. I said, let's let's go get something to eat. And I said, there's this guy. His name is Reggie. He's from Malaysia, and he's a film producer. Failed chef. That's part of the process. You know, you come from something and God uses you if you surrender and yep. a lot of many most of the time there's a major failure major mm. failure and that's part of the dying to yourself process not always but and i said honey he did this documentary he was a failed chef and did this first documentary the first time he'd ever run a camcorder or anything he googled how to make a movie <laughs> 
did a documentary on the identity of the Chinese people. And I said, he ended up winning first place in the Pan Pacific Film Festival in the United States. He never came here to enter it. Campus Crusade entered it in, in that contest. And, and anyway, long story short, I don't want to get too weedy in Reggie's story, but I said, honey, he did all this stuff and God is just using him in profound ways. And he looked at me and told me he would, I would connect him in the United States. I said, we got to find him somehow in Florida. I said, I don't know. How do you find somebody from Malaysia in Orlando, Florida? And I pulled up my phone again. We were sitting at this restaurant and spending way more than we had probably, but I don't know. We were sitting at this restaurant. I have my phone in walks Reggie with this computer right up to me. And I'm like, honey, this is Reggie. And she goes, oh, nice to meet you. I just heard a little bit of your story. My husband's just talking about you. And she said, he told me a little bit about your story. And Reggie goes, oh, I've got my computer here. He pulled up his computer and within one minute was showing her the PowerPoint that he showed us on the bus. And one thing after another started happening. And I, I'll fast forward a little bit through two chairs, through discerning how God was going to, you know, complete this circle with Reggie. So then what you were exposed to and were experiencing now, your wife is starting to get the same experience. (laughs) Well, she's starting to, yeah. I mean, it just, she's experiencing what this, you know, what was happening. God was moving. We believe God was moving. And fast forward a little bit, and I asked Reggie, I said, I I said, I believe God wants me to ask you to do a documentary on the identity of the Native Americans. And he said, he said, well, that's really odd, interesting. And he started asking me a little bit about my story. And I said, well, actually, I said, I, I, I've been told my father was orphaned. I know that. And I've been told that my, I don't know how many greats, but like great, 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 great grandma Nan escaped the trail of tears. And Reggie believed that it was her blood crying out through me to help restore in part the broken treaties. And it was her blood crying out Mm. for um, restoration of the people that they, the people group that they were and get to get their story right and things of that nature. So that that's like a, a, just a little icing on the cake. (laughs) Just that's not the whole story. There's like hundreds of things more that have happened then that are even more confirmational and profound. Yeah. For you guys listening and for those listening who might know Chris, <laughs> Chris is full of these stories. It's just every time we get together, I hear another new story about how the spirit is moved in your life and the the fruits of obedience. It's just, uh, that's what I love about you, man. Oh, thanks. The, the fact that, okay, let's go back to the the moment when you called your wife. She's, her her schedule is booked up with work. Not to mention you guys can't afford to fly her down there in the first place yet. Yet again, another example of obedience and the power that can come out of that. Because I know for a fact that if I were in your shoes, I, I maybe would call my wife and the two of us would then quickly agree like, oh, this is dumb. We can't afford it. And, and you've got to work. Move on to the next thing. We wouldn't have probably given it a second chance, but... I think it underscores the importance of recognizing when the spirit is moving us and directing us and then having the faith and the courage to, regardless of the worldly implications, to take that step of faith. Cause that's what it was for you at that yeah. moment. Yeah. I don't think that too many people can honestly say that they would do that. I don't know. I could be wrong. Yeah. I don't, I don't want to go back on the, the obedience and the self-respect thing because I, going back to 2008 where I felt like I was supposed to sell everything. I didn't just feel like it. I was going through a business development process and I wrote all about it. I'm like, this, this doesn't make sense. Well, that was right before the crash. 
mm. that would have been a good time to sell, you know, to, right. to, to sell a bunch of stuff. And I, we would have been cash rich, you know, moving into the recession and, you know, a lot of, a lot of people know we really didn't make money after that, you know, but going, going back to the whole, um, obedience thing and things, I guess I should say that, um, just to fast forward a little bit, Reggie did end up coming to South Dakota and we went on a journey and I, I have bullet points of significant things that happened that were like, there's 130 bullet points on the, he, he came for 22 days. We ended up out on the reservation in Pine Ridge. We were referred by a, a spiritual friend of ours, uh, Wade McCarg, um, to this gal. And she is like the spiritual, some sort of the spiritual leader or something like that of the native Americans to the United nations. Mm. Amazing woman. I love her dearly, Norma. And, uh, we were referred out to her nursing home to talk to her. And as soon as we walked in, she started crying. I was videoing. We set up a video camera and I like, I know how to do that. And I videoed her and she told us, on video for an hour and a half about how she'd been praying for us to come specifically. And she knew that we were going to be doing something for the native Americans in some capacity or another. And that was profound. Then we ended up getting invited into a classroom of some junior high kids down. I think they're junior high. Maybe they were freshmen um, kids in lower Brule. They invited us into their classroom to, and, and they wanted to, they, they were interested in the concept of, okay, what are you guys doing here? And they, they, we asked them questions about how it's going down there while well, they had, they had a lot of kids in their classrooms that had, that had committed suicide. Yeah. It's a big Just epidemic. A tremendous number of them. And because Reggie was not an American um, they didn't really know what he was or who they were. Um, they answered his questions and he just asked questions kind of like Christ asked questions and told stories, you know, and that was profound to witness that and, uh, just hear how they, they want us to come back. They're waiting for us to come back. They invited us to come back. And here's another thing that was profound and I got to kind of build a little bit of a backstory with this, but we were invited to do a Buffalo hunt, right? Okay. So I'm like, okay, that's cool. And, and I shared that around a little bit and I was like, yeah, I guess the tribal chief or whatever, somebody invited us to do a Buffalo hunt, somebody significant. And this is the same cool. trip out there. Yeah. Yeah. And I was like, okay, that's pretty cool. But, is that a big deal? I shared this and they're like the, the tribal chief invited you to do a Buffalo hunt. It's like, yeah, is that weird or what? I guess that that's pretty honoring. That's, that's a tremendous honor. Well, I didn't really understand the significance of that until I started again, later on in my, this process years, a couple years later, um, I ended up, I set up my two chairs and went up to the penitentiary as a result of of what i believe the two chairs shared with me i was looking for a wooden box i didn't go into the pen but i and we should uh, quickly clarify <laughs> you weren't living at the penitentiary <laughs> so you, i you do some work there yeah so I, I i i was like okay i need this i need a wooden box a significant box um wooden box. I call it the 828 blessing box, but I felt like God said, go up to the prison to pheasant land industries to the industry and they can help you with the box. So I went up there and started talking to them about the box and they, the, the director literally started crying and asked if I would come into the prison and work with the inmates building programs and use the words that I use to inspire the, the prisoners. And I'm like, geez, I, I'm trained to do that. You know, I helped with Dale Carnegie. I, 
understand some Ziegler principles and training, but I'm a biblical entrepreneurship, biblical entrepreneurship instructor. And that's, you know, those are all spiritual, you know, mm-hmm. biblical principles that you share. You speak to people's spirit and listen to, you know, you, you listen to them and watch their demeanor and, you know, you use biblical principle. And, uh, so I was like, wow, okay. So the second time I went into the prison, my dear, dear friend, Pat, who retires tomorrow, um, Pat says to me, he takes me into this big room and I'd only made one trip there before. And we walk into this huge room and it's all cleared out. And there's like this big deck up above us and this big area down below workspace all cleared out. And I said, wow, Pat, I'm a business guy. I'm surprised you guys aren't capitalizing on the space, you know, that you don't, it's not facilitating something for the inmates. And he said, Chris, after watching the inmates, when you came up here last time and you talked to them and, and the, some of the inmates were crying, which is not a, an unusual result result. If you speak to their spirit, Mm -hmm. tears are the most pure form of worship, I believe. But he said, we cleared this space out for you. And I was choked up and I said, what? And he goes, yeah. And here's another thing. He said, we were talking and this probably won't make sense, but I don't know if, if you would consider starting some sort of a Buffalo tanning operation up here or something. <laughs> and I, you know, the ties back to Buffalo, the Native American, again, Buffalo, for those, the people that don't know, Buffalo are a tremendous sign of provision for the Native American oh, community. Yeah. And I'm sitting here right in front of me. Now we have, I have a Buffalo leather covered Bible open in front of me. But, um, yeah, just one thing after another has happened, which has resulted, we have not started a Buffalo tanning operation, but, uh, yet but I can see it. So I believe right. it's already done. You know, um, I, I can see it in the spiritual, but, uh, in God's time, but, um, yeah, it's been pretty interesting. That started a lot of programs up there that spun off of that conversation. Well, exactly. I mean, one step of obedience opened a door to a huge opportunity to speak to the hearts and souls of those inmates and, will sounds like lead to continue to lead to um, new and exciting opportunities man you're just you're just a walking example of how god can work through somebody if they just take the time to be still and listen and like we said at the opening i think the best practical uh one of the best practical ways to do that is to just very intentionally set up those two chairs open up a bible set it in one of the chairs and just listen to what God's trying to say. Because if we don't take that very intentional step, then, and I can speak from personal experience, we just get too busy. Huh. Too busy. And even if even if we take time to pray, if we haven't set up the physical environment to facilitate those deeper conversations with God, then we're going to get pulled away. Yeah. By something in the room or something in our heads, which yeah. is my case. I, I, I'll, I'll just stop working and I'll... I'll pray, but then I'll, you know, I'll hear a ding on my phone or an email come in and instantly my mind is somewhere else. So, yeah, I think it's that, that very practical step of, or exercise of setting up the Bible in that empty chair and then pulling up a chair for yourself sets the stage to have those deep, meaningful conversations. Yep. But then being obedient is the the key. Yeah. Yeah. Spend, spend, spending time in the word, you know, understanding so I'll, I'll, I'll share this real quick because work is such a signet, like Mark said, work, work is so significant for guys. And that's God's first command to Adam was he put him in the garden to work. Right. That word work is avadah from the Hebrew, um, which means to, to work, you know, you work is worship. And there, there's always a component of serving other people. So go back up to the penitentiary. Um, there, there was a guy that was working on a project for me, a wooden box. And he came up to me and the first thing he asked me, he said, are you a pastor? And I said, look at me. 
<laughs> I said, I spent 55,000 hours scooping rock. I said, no, I'm not a pastor. I'm beat up. I'm a worker guy, just like you are. And again, he's in the industry. And he goes, well, why are you here? And I said, okay, here's the deal. And I, because I can, because I'm a worker, he gets, gets it. You know, I'm a, we have that camaraderie, you know, instantly, you know, that maybe that unilateral respect he's, he can do something, you know, with his hands. And I grabbed his hands, which kind of shocked him a little bit. And I said, look at these things. I said, here's the deal. I said, through these hands, you can build things because you can, you can. You can do this. You can build things through your hands because of the love in your heart and because of the work of your hands. You can build things for people that are in a perspective of their own hell. You can do that because the products that we are building up here that I believe are going to be built through these hands, and I lift his hands up a little bit, and I say the products that you build through these hands will bring hope to a family that has lost and buried a child. So much hope because they know somebody somewhere loves them enough to serve them in a capacity where they bring out the detail. In this case, wooden boxes bring out the detail of the challenge that the the tree has survived, the character and the cracks and all that stuff. They accentuate that the challenge that the tree has overcome and they look at the products that come through these hands that are made through these hands and they have hope maybe for the first time knowing that somebody some somewhere loves them. And because of that biblical principle, I mean, they cry and they, 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 it's so easy to transfer that information. And if they say, where do you get this information? You can show them in the Bible, uh, Avada, to work is to worship that the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden to work. Mm-hmm. So that's an activation, and you can let them read that, and then they understand that I'm not up there. I, I'm not a pastor, but I definitely have a ministry, and I can show them how to activate those biblical principles by reading the Bible for themselves. And my prayer is that the work that I do up there, they 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 don't remember me, but they but they know that the Holy Spirit or something was up there, something changed them, and they know that the vehicle for those principles is the Bible. Mm-hmm. You know, so yeah, man. When we treat work as worship, then we all have a ministry, right? Mm-hmm. It doesn't matter what we're doing, whether That's, we're cleaning toilets or designing buildings, right? Absolutely. Amen. To it that. all serves the kingdom. Yeah. And yeah, it, yeah, it's amazing. Chris, thank you so much for coming back on and sharing your insights and helping me kind of unpack and, um, contemplate, um, my next steps. I don't think this podcast is going anywhere anytime soon, but appreciate your, all your biblical wisdom. Thank you, God, for, for completing us with each other. Yeah. Thank you so much for that. Would you do me a favor and pray us out? I would love to. Dear Heavenly Father, just thank you so much for this opportunity to to, to come together and like I just said, to, to complete each other with uh, with what we were set apart to accomplish in this world. That's Jeremiah one five, dear Heavenly Father. Thank you for that. Thank you for for wiring us specifically, weaving us together, knitting us together to do specific things. And my prayer for, for Mark, my prayer for each and every listener that's listening to this right now would know that the gift that they are for this world, the gift that they are to this world is likely a gift like a fruit, like the sweetest tasting fruit that some people have ever had and people are dying of malnourishment all around them, waiting for them to produce the fruit that they were put here to produce, to nourish those people that they were put here to nourish. Dear Heavenly Father, the work that they were put here to do. So I pray that people would would 
know and understand what that means, that that would resonate with their spirit and that they would, they would, their spirit would be invigorated and enlivened and that their, their zest and their zeal to serve other people to work is just, is just unprecedented that they would just, they, that they would just understand how significant they are. So I pray all these things in Jesus' precious name. Just bless them, dear Heavenly Father. Bless them. Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Guys, thanks for listening. If you enjoyed today's conversation, share it with a friend and subscribe to the show so you don't miss future episodes like the one you heard today. And be sure to check today's show notes for all the ways you can stay plugged into the Inspired Legacy, including my free download called Nine Ways to Be a Better Dad. You can sign up for my free weekly devotional called Inspired Inbox, and you can join the private Facebook group, a community of other like-minded men looking to become the best husbands and fathers they can be. So get plugged in, like, subscribe, leave a review, and help more guys find the show because we need more men battling together for the sake of the next generation. Until next time, live inspired.